morning, Parallel Church. How are y'all doing today? Good, good. Let's welcome everyone that's joining us at one of our campuses. Welcome Tabor, Claire's Home, Okotoks, Lloyd Minster, Lethbridge, and of course all of you joining us online, wherever you're watching from around the world, special welcome to all of you. And today we're concluding our series, Rethink. And if you have missed one or more of these messages, I'd highly encourage you to go back and and really they build upon each other. And we're going to be wrapping it up today with a little bit of a Bible study, actually quite a bit of a Bible study. But if you missed one of these, these are foundational uh, foundational messages uh, based on we're trying to rediscover and rethink what Christianity is, especially we're deconstructing modern Christianity in many ways and taking a, a look at things. And the reason why we're doing that is because, because when I read the book of Acts and I start to see the results of, uh, especially in the book of Acts and in, in, in the epistles and, and the letters that Paul and Peter and John wrote to the early church, I become envious of the results that I see in, in the early church. Like they saw power and miracles and salvations and transformation exponentially. I'm going, I want some of that. And yet the Bible promises that the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And I, I believe that to the core of my being and saying, we got to rethink some things in order to get back to what, what Jesus intended. And we're going to look at, uh, again, some of the scriptures that we've been basing this series on. We're going to kind of uh, bounce around a little bit uh, between two gospels in particular. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter uh, 16, and then you can keep a finger in, in Luke chapter 9, and, and you know, oftentimes when we read the Gospels, I, and I talk with a lot of people who are new to the faith or new to, to reading the Bible, and I get, you know, one of the most common questions is, well, how come there's four Gospels? How come there's four different, you know, uh, accounts of Jesus's life? Why, like, why, why did there need to be, you know, duplicates or four different accounts? And one of the easiest ways to understand this is, have you ever been to, you know, a spectacular event or something like that with your friends and you're recounting it with other friends? And as you're recounting it, you know, and the person beside you that was there with you accounts their thing, they inevitably bring up something that you forgot. Anybody else? Like something else that stood out to them didn't necessarily stand out to you and something that stood out to you doesn't necessarily stand out to them. And in order to get the, the, the accuracy of all the spectacular things that happened around Jesus' life, I think the disciples got together and began to recount some of these things. And, and today we're going to see Matthew's account and from what his perspective. We're also going to see Peter's account as he translated, you know, as he dictated that to Dr. Luke or, and to Luke who wrote that uh, in, in the book of Luke. And the account we're going to start in Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 13. It says, in verse 13, it says, when now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? This is Matthew 16. This is well into Jesus' uh, ministry with his disciples. And it's the first time, though, that he asked this question, hey, who do people say that I am? Which is an interesting question coming from Jesus because his disciples could have looked at him and said, well, Jesus, you don't really seem to care about what everybody else thinks about you. Um, why are you caring now? And yet Jesus is using this question and this dialogue that we're about to dive into to reveal two major things about himself and about his future plans. What's fascinating to me is that this happens, and what I want you to, to really focus on or pay attention to is where this happens. This happens in the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is northern Israel, kind of near the, the border of Syria. And this in particular, Caesarea Philippi at this time was, was known for housing seven pagan temples. It was one of the darkest, most demonic parts in all of Israel. It had seven pagan temples that were kind of etched into, into the mountain in the region nearby. It had the temple of Caesar, in particular the temple of Caesar Augustus. It had the temple of the god Pan. It had the temple of, of Zeus. It had the gates of Hades, which is a real place. It might be familiar, those of you who know this story, know this account, but the gates of Hades was, was not in particular talking about, you know, hell. 
It was actually a physical place, a demonic place in which it was the worst of the worst, pagan sacrifices, pagan uh, you know, rituals, worship happened. The gates of Hades was a, a cave or cavern, a large cavern where human sacrifices and animal sacrifices were happened for pagan rituals. It was the darkest, it was in, in a region, it was the darkest, most demonic place in all of Israel. And it's here, in this location, that Jesus decides to ask this question and begins to reveal who he was, but also begins to reveal his future plans. Fascinating. Verse 14, it says, And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, Peter's saying, you're the one we grew up uh, anticipating and being taught about and, and believing you're the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjono, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, we've looked at verse 18 in particular. It's kind of been the anchor of, of, our, of our series. And in particular, we looked at that this word church is not the exact word that Jesus used. That word church was later, uh, much later, 1,500 years later, inserted into the translation by King James and in particular and his translators that the word the original word that Jesus actually used was I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia was a secular term that that was kind of shocking for you know for Jesus to use. He didn't say I will build my synagogue. He didn't say I will build my temple or my tabernacle. He didn't say I will build my network of synagogues. He said I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia was a common Greek Roman term that meant simply meant you know a concerned group of citizens that would meet and discuss the issues and take care of the issues of the city. It would be kind of like city council meeting. It would be kind of like you know the Romans would use it to talk about the senate meeting to discuss issues over the empire and Jesus reveals it's interesting that Jesus in you know in the shadows of of seven pagan temples one of them being the gates of Hades where some of the most horrific horrendous you know rituals would take place in it's in this spiritual dark place that Jesus reveals number one who he is but number two his future plan his ecclesia his future strategy and, and, and what he says to them is, I'm going to, I'm going to build, I will build my ecclesia, my gathering of concerned citizens, and not even the darkest demonic forces will be able to withstand against a few of you. Wow. Wow. And then he goes on to reiterate and to show that, that Jesus meant business and that that he was saying listen i'm revealed to to you who i am but i'm also revealing to you who you are and then he says i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven in other words the keys of the kingdom and he chooses this location to reveal it. Now, in Luke, Luke's gospel, we see the same thing, you know, as dictated by Peter to, to Luke. And we see the exact same events happening in Luke 9, verse 18 to 22. You can fact check me if you'd like. Uh, but the same things, the same interaction that Jesus just had with his disciples, Luke gives his version of it. But it's fascinating to me in Luke's gospel as to the rest of the events or what happens next. And what happens next is right after Jesus reveals and has this conversation with disciples and saying, I am the Messiah and, and I'm going to build my ecclesia. Right after that, Jesus says, to, Jesus goes and takes them up the mountain and has the, the Mount of Transfiguration. For those of you who might not be aware of what the Transfiguration was, Jesus went up this mountain with, his, with three of his disciples 
Uh, Peter, James, and John, he goes up this mountain and, and he transfigures or his, his image changes and he begins to glow and, and, and God himself comes down and begins to speak from, from, a, from, a, from a cloud and, and Moses and Elijah show up and this crazy, crazy supernatural, one of the most significant supernatural events that happened in all of the life of Jesus happens on this mountain in Caesarea Philippi and the mountain is actually Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is the location of the seven pagan temples, many of them etched right into the rocks. The cavern of the gates of Hades is on Mount Hermon, and it's here, it's here, kind of like Jesus, isn't it? It's here that Jesus makes his declaration, that Jesus makes his statement. And Jesus is doing this here, on purpose to make a point because, again, of what happens next. Look what happens right after this. Verse 37 of Luke chapter 9 says, On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them, and a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seized him and suddenly screams, and it throws him into convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. Okay? Should we be surprised? Just think about this. In the context, in the location where this happens, should we be surprised that there's demonic activity, that there's oppression, that there's possession, that there's demonic activity. In this. this is seven pagan temples, human sacrifices, and a boy gets demon-possessed. I just want you to know, just, just to know, just so we're clear, spiritual warfare is a very real thing. Okay, you might not have seen demonic possession. I have. I've, I've been part of praying for people and, and seeing demons flee. I've seen these kind of things. The devil is not, does not play fair. The devil is not nice. The devil is real, and he's got power. You're going to see that. If you don't believe me, you're going to see that. There's, he's got some teeth. He's got some power. And he's possessed this little boy. Now watch what happens next. It says in verse 40, I begged your disciples to cast it out. And they could not. Wait, in the context, what just, what's just happened? What's just happened is Jesus reveals to them, I am the Son of God, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. And he turns around and, and you are the ecclesia. They're very clear in this. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. We just read this, right? This just happened. This just happened. And the next day or, or, or day or two after, they're, they're, they've been given, they've been told, they've got the keys of the kingdom, and they can't cast out a demon. So Jesus' response, he says, I begged your disciples to cast them out, and they could not. Jesus answered and said, look at this, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Ouch. This is an unusually harsh statement from Jesus. We learned last week that Jesus got down and protected an adulterous woman. We, like, the grace that Jesus exuded, the love, the patience, the kindness that Jesus exuded. And yet here he looks and says, man, you prefer to generate, how long am I going to put up with you? Which we'd look at this and going, well, that's not very nice. But how many of you are parents have ever said, no, okay, no one's going to put up their hand. Okay. <laughs> How long am I going to put up with you? Why, did, why was Jesus so upset? Because he just told them, I've given you the keys. I've given you the authority. I've given you all this. And right after that, they can't do that. Which is why Jesus is upset. So what does he do? He says, bring your son here. And while he was approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. 
I love Luke's little kind of, there's no exclamation mark. There's no big spectacular event. There's like, it's just like the demon ca- caused a scene, threw the boy down. Jesus heals him and just move on. <laughs> like, hello. Like, of course he did. All right, Jesus just heals the boy and gives him back to his father. And then it says, and, and they were all amazed at the greatness of God. And they were all amazed. Who was all amazed? The crowd around, but also the disciples amazed. We just, we know who he is, but they are amazed at the greatness. May we be amazed. Come on. At the greatness. May we understand and see. I'm hoping you're going to get this. The greatness of our God. Now, in Matthew's account, if you go back to Matthew, the disciples right after all this, Matthew 17, the disciples ask, how come we couldn't cast out the devil? Like, it's a fair question. And Jesus answers them in verse 20, chapter 17. And he says to them, because of the littleness of your faith, Ouch. But then, even more ouch, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed. Have anybody ever seen a mustard seed? Like, you can't get smaller than a mustard seed. If I was to hold up a mustard seed, you would, right now, you, none of you would be able to see it. It's so small. So Jesus just says, look at this. Jesus just says, Why couldn't you cast it out? Because of the smallness of your faith. If you just had faith this small. So in other words, your faith wasn't even this small. If you just had faith this small, you would cast out devils. You would move mountains. Now watch. Come on, come on, come on. And nothing would be impossible for you. Then he says, but this kind does not come out except for prayer and fasting. So here, here, I want you to see something. I want you to understand something. Very, very key. Because you are, are and I, in our, in our human nature, we are all fascinated by power. And we're all fascinated by, and, and we're, when we read the story, we are focused on, and I've heard it preached so many times, I've preached it so many times in this way, that we're focused on the size of their faith. Jesus says, you couldn't do this because of the littleness of your faith, but if you had the faith the size of mustard seed, and they're thinking, you mean our faith was littler than, than that? And Jesus is eventually, by using this analogy, saying, it's not the size that matters. It's not the power at all. It has nothing to do with the power of your faith. It doesn't have to do with anything. And he says this. He says, it's just by, except for prayer and fasting. Okay? But they're like, we did pray. Oh, we forgot to fast. We should probably, if we fasted, and we focus on this, don't we? We focus on these things. But listen, And you take all of this, and you can take all of this out of context, and if you take it out of context, you can miss exactly what Jesus is saying. Because what happens right after this, after this encounter, after they ask this question, right after this, in Caesarea Philippi, in the exact same thing, what does Jesus do next? What Jesus does next is he sends them out two by two in this region, and he doesn't just send out the three that went up the mountain with him that, that saw that with faith. He doesn't just send out the 12 that have been his close disciples. He sends them out, 72 of them, two by two in the very region, right after the same group couldn't cast out a devil of a small boy. He sends them into the same region. And we don't see a leg in time. We don't see, again, what I want you to see here is we don't see them having time to get prayed up, powered up, and we don't see them fasting. In fact, when he sends them out two by two, what's one of the instructions he gives them? Eat whatever is set before you. Right? And they come back 
In chapter 10 of, of Luke, they come back, and this is their report, verse 17. They come back, and their report is simply returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In other words, we did it. <laughs> like, we couldn't cast out the devils, that, that, that little boy, but we did it. We did it. It worked. Again, this is Caesarea Philippi. Again, this is a demonic stronghold. Again, Jesus cast out the devil of a, of a little boy. He says, you, you couldn't do this because of prayer and fasting. We don't see any of that going on. And he sends them out and he says to them, watch that watch because he gives us something so powerful that you and I need to see and understand. In verse 18, Luke chapter 10, and he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. When, what? Well, Jesus was praying for them. They were going out two by two. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. In other words, he says, I saw something in the region change. Transformation in the most demonic portion of Israel. He says, I saw transformation. I saw something change. And by the way, there ain't no seven pe uh, pagan temples there anymore. And by the way, the gates of Hades doesn't exist anymore in that location. Okay, it, it, by, the, like, by the way, you name your dog or cat Caesar and your children Peter and John. What does that have to do with anything? The strongest, the temple of Caesar <laughs> was rendered to nothing. I saw Satan fall. Jesus says, how? Verse 19, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. There's so much in this verse. I need you to understand so much, so much. I've given you what? Authority. authority. Over what? The power. Did you, did, you rec did you recognize, you see this? You see that Jesus acknowledges that the devil has power? You see that? He's not denying. He's not flexing his muscles and saying, yeah, I, he's got, I got more. It's not, not about the size of the power. Okay, let me just put it this way. I'll use an analogy. I have, uh, uh, I own a 75 uh, Ford pickup that has a 460 engine in it. I'm going to date myself right here, but... Her, 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 her. Uh, uh, it's got power. Like, I mean, I'm, and, and the sound of that engine, come on. Come on, us guys, and all the girls are like, mm-hmm, so. But all, all the guys are like, all, you, you were falling asleep, but all of a sudden now you're paying attention. Like, ugh. We're enamored with power, aren't we? Like power, like something has power. But did you know it doesn't matter the power of the engine until, until it's harnessed by the authority of the steering wheel? That the engine can have all the power in the world and make all the noise in the world and be all impressive, all the rest of it, but it just takes, come on, it just takes the authority of the steering wheel to decide where that, end, that power is harnessed and where it goes. And what did Jesus say? I have given you the steering wheel over all the power of the enemy. It doesn't matter. That's why he says it's, the, the, it's not the size of your faith. It's not you getting yourself all powered up. It's you recognize I have the authority to steer. Oh, come on. Come on. You're not getting this yet. Because, hey, you can think, listen, you can think, you can think all you want that you work in the most demonic place and there's so much power and there's so much this and there's all this and there's no, no one's going to get saved and all the blah, 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 all, the, all this kind of stuff and going and I need to pray harder and I need to be, I need to have more faith and we, we think that. I need to do more. I need to do more. And I need you to realize, come on, you don't have to power up. You need to recognize your authority. This is what Jesus is saying. This is why I believe Jesus announced who he was and his plan for the ecclesia, which the ecclesia... The ecclesia wasn't a temple with power 
or a synagogue, come on, or a church where we have two or three hundred gathered together there. And it's the power isn't in a, a meeting or in a certain, after a certain atmosphere or with somebody super anointed wearing a white suit that, that we can see healings. The power is where two or three are gathered and you are been given what? The keys and the authority even over the power of the enemy. The devil likes to make lots of noise, doesn't he? <laughs> we got we don't just have steering, we have power steering. <laughs> Jesus like with one finger just just direct. Come on. Because this isn't that what he's saying? Okay, so and the disciples are getting this. They're they're watching this, they're seeing, they're getting this, and all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> we couldn't there. But we could hear because of your authority. <gasps> and they got excited. And they rejoiced. And then Jesus tells them, don't rejoice over this. This stuff is easy. Like, what are you celebrating over this? Celebrate. Listen, he says, don't celebrate that the spirit, that the, this, this, what does it say? That the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. What is Jesus re refocusing on? He says what really matters is not that you wielded power. What matters is that there was transformation and that souls got saved and that your soul is saved. That's what matters. He recenters on, on what this is for. We get this? Now, if you go back to Matthew's account... In Matthew 18, you with me still? Yeah. This side? I heard from this side. No, just, just making sure. Matthew 18, I need you to see this. Because look, we take all these scriptures and we take them individually. But this is all happening. Caesarea Philippi, transfiguration, two by two. All of this happening, all this interaction happening. And Jesus says this in verse 18 of Matthew 18. Still in the same region, still the same context, still the same. Jesus says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's already said that. He's reiterating again after they came back with the authority, after they came back with the power. And then verse 19, he says, again I say to you that if two, again, I've already told you. When did he tell them? When he told them that he's going to build the ecclesia. I told you, again, I'm repeating myself. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done to them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And there I am in the midst means I have the authority. There. He reiterates the ecclesia. Now watch. You should get this. The authority to cast out demons is given to individuals. We see that in Mark 16. Go into all the world and I'll give you authority or demonics and all the rest. Of it. That's given to individuals. But, and this is important, the authority to confront principalities, territories, is something only the ecclesia is empowered to do. The two or threes. And Paul confirms this. I need you to see this. This is important because sometimes we Christians get weird. We, we, sometimes. Come on. And we start exercising authority when we don't have it. And he told us where the authority is, right? And the authority is when two or three. Now watch. This is why I said find an ecclesia. Get an ecclesia. Find somebody else. Because watch. In, in Ephesians 3, this is what Paul says. He says that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, the ecclesia. Okay, that word church is not this ecclesia. That the, the wisdom of God might be made manifest, okay, made known through the ecclesia to what? The rulers and authorities in heavenly places. He says, in other words, that's where the authority happens when the two or three gather. The authority doesn't just happen when the two or three hundred gather. The authority happens when the two or three gather in your workplace. So let's sum it all up. The ecclesia is not an organization that, that gathers weekly. We have the authority not to wield uh, power, but to transform cities and regions and, and uh, have authority. How? And Jesus gave us the strategy in Luke chapter 10, didn't he? He sent them out 
two by two, and what did he tell them to do first? He says, pray to the Father. He, first, he said, first pray, when he sent them out two by two, right? First pray. Paul said it this way to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2. He says, first of all, that, that means, you know, a, a first priority, first instance, first of all, first of all, I urge I urge, that's not I suggest, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. He says, I, I urge you that you pray, church, pray for all men, for kings. Yeah, okay, even that. And we can go, I, I'm supposed to pray for the prime minister? Yes, but you don't know. Now, listen, this is Paul who is in, probably writing this from prison from who imprisoned him? The kings. Wrongly accused and persecuted, killed them, all the rest of them. He's like, pray for them. Why? So, and all who are in authority. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We can't complain about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket and how everything all the rest. He says, pray. Pray. First of all, pray. Then he says this. This is Good. And acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, the reason why you're praying is what? For the salvation of men. So he says, pray for the lost. You know, pray uh, for the lost before you talk to the lost. About God. Why pray? So that men and women... You can get saved. Then he says this in verse 8. Therefore, who, who's supposed to pray? Just the intercessors, just the pastors. No, therefore, I want the men in every place. Every place, workplace. Why? Because ecclesia isn't about a, a, a one gathering. It's every, in every place. I want men and women, by the way, to pray in every place. Doing what? Lifting up holy hands. I'm not that type of Christian. He said it. All of us. I want all of us pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath or dissension. Why without wrath or dissension? Because that is going to shut down. Peter said that. <laughs> Even dissension in your marriage is going to shut down your prayer. That's in the Bible, by the way. Okay, right? So he says, pray. Why? Who's supposed to pray? All of us. Why? Because we're the ecclesia. What happens if we do this? Paul said this in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. He says, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath his feet. No, underneath your feet. And Jesus said, come on. I'm hoping you're getting this. You take the events of Luke chapter 9, chapter 10, Matthew 16, 17, and 18, and you read them and you put it all together. And Jesus just gave us the master strategy of how to be the ecclesia and how to transform a region. And it worked. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan. I saw Satan fall like lightning. The God of, not the God of war. We, we focus on spiritual warfare. We focus on fight. We want to fight. Let's get to, we want to fight. And it's the God of peace that will soon crush Satan. It's interesting that he says the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. It's interesting because Paul said, talking about in Ephesians 6, talking about spiritual warfare, that your feet will be shod with what? The gospel of peace. <laughs> so because we focus on the warfare and we focus on, on, on the God of war, we fight instead of walking in peace. And we fight for power instead of walking in authority. You don't need to fight the steering wheel most of the time. <laughs> right? You just, especially there's power, just turn it we fight why because authority always trumps power it's today's takeaway authority always trumps power satan will be crushed underneath our feet our feet god does the fighting if we do the walking walking 
Jesus said this in Matthew. We looked at this in the series. Go, in your going, in your going, preach the gospel. In your walking to work and around work. In your walking around your school. In your walking around wherever you're going. In your walking. Walk with the gospel of peace. So first, we pray. We pray. I urge you all, first of all, pray. Jesus said, I'm sending you out two by two. Pray to the God of the harvest. Pray. Secondly, we bless. We speak well. Solomon said this in Proverbs 11. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. That we have the power. Come on. We have the power to exalt a city by the blessing of a city. So we pray, we bless, we speak well of our city, we speak well of our workplace, we speak well of our region, we speak well of our nation because we're believing for their transformation. We pray, we speak well, and then what do we do? Then he said, Jesus said, hang out, fellowship, build relationship, eat what is set before you, stay and, and you know, reside, build relationship. And then fourthly, he said, meet their felt needs, heal the sick, meet their felt needs. And then fifthly, he says, tell them about the kingdom. Pray, first of all. Speak well, build a relationship, meet felt needs, and then tell. You have the authority in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood, in this city, not as hundreds, but as two or three. pray God I thank you so much for your word I thank you for the clarity Jesus that you gave the understanding that you gave the authority and the confidence in which the disciples were able to transform the regions around them and Lord I pray for each one here Holy Spirit, that you deposit in each one of our hearts that purpose, that call, that you'd solidify that revelation in our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. I found it interesting this morning that our team chose to, to, to lead the song, I Love You, Lord. I found that interesting because some of you might think that, well, that was a new song. <laughs> um, it's not. It's rather old. Um, so old, in fact, that when I was six or seven years old, I had, I had, I don't even know how to describe it, but I had a demonic oppressions and, and nightmares. I was terrified to go to sleep terrified of bed and terrified of sleep because every time I would lay in my bed at, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, it went on for a period of time. As soon as I closed my eyes, I'd have like bombarded with darkness and demonic thoughts and, and bad dreams and nightmares, and it was terrible. And the way that I fought my way through this at six, seven years old is I sang that song. And I thought, isn't that funny? that the team chose to sing that song today when I'm talking about our spiritual authority. And that was a song at six years old. Did I have faith? No, I didn't even know what faith was. That the size of my faith was smaller than a mustard seed. I had nothing. But all I had is the gospel of peace. That was it. If you're here this, today and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to begin a relationship with him. It's not complex. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to fight for his acceptance. Not at all. All you need to do is simply 
confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that he rose again from the dead and you'll be saved. Paul said that in Romans 10. So I'm going to lead you all in a prayer right now. If you pray this prayer and you believe what you're praying is true right here, right now, you can begin relationship with Jesus. If you're watching online, pray with me where you're watching from. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and my Savior, and my friend. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name.